Well, good morning. Uh, I'm happy to be here again. I was here before and probably talking the same thing, except uh, today I have a little throat problem. I got something in the wrong place, in different place of the world, and got something that I really shouldn't have. Uh, so uh, this is not very clear, I guess, not in color either. Uh, what I'm going to uh, talk today is uh, first, uh, do we have evidence in our universe in which we live that God exists? Is there at least that probability in science we don't deal with actuals, but say when it comes to absolute, say the probability is there that God or the Creator does exist. And uh, in uh, 1990, 1999, world's leading <coughs> experts in the field of quantum cosmology and uh, global general relativity met at Berkeley, California to discuss convergence and divergence between science and religion. And main question was, uh, that was asked, is there enough evidence in here, where I, what I call quantum branch, to believe in God? And the answer was unanimous, yes that evidence exists, that uh, there is a role for creator in our universe. Uh, scientists like late uh, uh, Stephen Hawking said, my work tells me that there is a role for God in universe, but I personally do not need that. And that's fine. That's honest, being honest. It is, we cannot uh, prove that Creator exists, but we cannot also prove that he does not exist. There's just no way to do that. So that is still up to individual to accept by faith. But we can point out a few things that can reinforce a personal belief in God. And there are many things in our universe that reinforce our belief in Creator. Some of the things, main things that are still very uh, problematic in, in quantum cosmology, I'll talk this afternoon about it, but it's those, uh, the parameters that are in the universe that we simply do not know how did they come into existence. No one predicted, no one knew, but recently they were discovered and no one yet, yet has an answer why? Some are hoping for uh, uh, some kind of natural answer to the question, to the things that are in our universe. Uh, talking here, we really live in this, but only in a half of this. So uh, I'll be talking afternoon more about it. Uh, but they, they said, okay, we have uh, that <clears throat> creator probably exists. Uh, because science doesn't say does, you know, it probably exists. Me, I say it does, and I'm sure you say it does exist, uh, because we believe so, you know. Uh, we all have probably personal experiences that reinforce our personal belief in God, but we cannot say it is this way. Uh, we go by what we see and what the God gave us to go by so the, the many scientists, uh, uh, more scientists are inclined to accept the probability that the creator does exist, or they call it ultimate intelligence. Uh, or final observer, which I will shift to final observer. Uh, but uh, many, you know, some are only saying no, but those are saying the universe is just too strange that something isn't there besides what we see and what we know. So something must be there. So they revert, they're reverting to what we call anthropic principle that's based on, uh, on uh, or series of observers. Uh, the, what we call Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics, which is quantum mechanics, uh, the chief creator of quantum mechanics is Neil Bohr, and he was from Copenhagen, so that's known as Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics. It states that properties of objects like this, this 
do not exist until we observe them. We as an intelligent observer, we observe that and therefore they exist because uh, this chair is not in that shape by itself. It is that way because that is how I see it. That is how you see it. And it, it's a little strange, isn't it? But the experiment points that way. Really, it is that way. So, uh, you know, they don't have an answer. So they said, okay, if that is so, then there must be a series. This is, uh, this psi, uh, should be capital psi in Greek, represents all, it's a symbol which represents all possible knowledge about our universe or quantum branch. And that says that in order to accommodate that knowledge, there are series of intelligent observations that happen. But then we have also entanglement problem that this here is a single entity. It is not divided. There is no, if I do this, the entire universe what, where we live felt that at that instant no passage of time. That is the nature of our universe, experimentally demonstrated. So, uh, say, okay, if, uh, they say, okay, if that this here, this means a sequence <coughs> of se infinite sequence of series of observational wave function by all possible observers, but there is no last term. Because if you put last term, because of uh, entanglement, the wave function would collapse at any point, and you wouldn't get the universe that we need. So, so they said, OK, if you say that there is a final observer, and he is, if he is right here, <clears throat> that will definitely collapse wave function. So they came with an axiom that, uh, uh, contrary to collapse axiom, they say, OK, the final observer does not invoke the collapse axiom because he is not in this universe where we live. He's outside. He's looking at it as us. So he takes all intelligent observations within the universe and he puts it together into one whole. And therefore, he does not violate the law that way. So, and universe exists because there is no, no chance to collapse the function before its time. God does everything in fullness of time. Fullness of time is known only to him, but not to you and I. So, you know, whether we will ever know, probably never. So, uh, I, I'm convinced never. So, that's, that's his, his to know. So, they said, okay, final observer is not here. So, he is, uh, <clears throat> where is he? According to mathematics that we do about our universe, Final observer <clears throat> must be located in uh, future infinity, or, or what we mathematically, also those who know mathematics, uh, it's, a, it's a mathematical point called singularity. At singularity, all laws, <clears throat> all laws known to us simply cease to function. But universe doesn't cease to function, you know, just laws cease to exist. So they said, OK, let's take universe, uh, simulate, simulate on computer, take it to distant, future distant singularity uh, to see what happens. And at that point, the implication, one of the implications is that this final observer here, last term, does exist, and he loves us. That, you know, it didn't come, you know, that, that theologian said it, but uh, doing mathematics, that implication, they, that, that came that way. So, okay, said, uh, he loves us, but then what about, what's the universe? They also came up that the very foundation of this universe here is uh, selfless love, which is called in Greek agape. You know, that's, so... People, we have experts who are concerned in the United States. We have, uh, there are probably some in Canada or everywhere. But our experts are strictly con concerned about long range survival of, of humankind on this earth here. Because our, <clears throat> our earth in a very recent, a fairly recent past, has experienced very, very violent upheaval 
it is no longer in optimum equilibrium. It cannot support uh, carbon-based intelligent life the way it should. I mean, that is fact. That's biblical flood, if you will. No, it, it's uh, that most probable, and I'm convinced that is, at that time an asteroid, a big asteroid, hit Earth uh, to what is today North Pacific and just broke up the Earth like you break up an egg. Now all those tectonic plates are moving around the tribe because they have memory. Uh, how they have memory, it's designed in, into it memory. When we build airplanes and rockets, and there are certain components in it that must always be that. But while it's functioning, it can bend. So by a specific kind of annealing, we put in memory into a component. If it gets bent, it returns the, the, uh, the way it was. It, it knows on its own that it's not supposed to be that way, but this way. So Earth is the same way. It isn't said, I'm not supposed to be the way I'm right now. So everything is moving back to where it used to be. And we have 40,000 earthquakes that happen on Earth today, each year. So that's what it, But I said, OK, <clears throat> they said these experts who are concerned, because Earth is that way, this was all in 1990s, that early 90s, late 80s, early 90s, that we were debating on it. I was part of it from military side because we need, needed to know what kind of military technology we need to prepare for the world that is coming. So that then they said, okay, that because the way it is, we have a maximum 200 years of life as we are accustomed to today. After that, we may have a maximum of about 1,000 years. Uh, after, after the 1,000 years, it'll become all but impossible to live on this planet. So the only solution, they said, is if we go and find another planet. And there is an agreement, international agreement, which is in place right now. And the world is in concept definition uh, for uh, whatever you call it, ship, spaceship, you know, something <clears throat> that will carry a multinational crew in, to land into area of Alpha Centauri in year 2110. They would have to start in 2085 in order to make it to Alpha Centauri in 2110. But that is now in definition. The only thing that will change that is when we launch a telescope into solar orbit in, in 2021, and that telescope will be able to confirm if planet orbiting uh, Alpha Centauri is in life belt, and if that planet can support carbon-based life, then they will definitely go there to look at it. Humans will go. But one nationality, one color, <clears throat> one civilization cannot do that. It, it, the universe does not accept because humankind is one. Last night I was saying it's one intelligence or one spirit. You know, there is a, a, a debate on that, but that is the way it is. I know, so, you know, we can talk about a lot that I like to talk about, but, uh, you know, humankind is one. And if we are going to explore space, these experts concluded, they, based on it, and, and they are firmly believe that, that this universe is based on selfless love, and that we all together must go in love. Otherwise, this universe will not accept us. I mean, that's not, uh, this doesn't come from theologian or somebody who is, uh, you know, I don't know if those people, you know, I, I talked with them, but we were forbidden to ask if, you know, do you go to church or what church or do you go synagogue or mosque or anything. That's forbidden in U.S. government to ask. So I don't know. They just sounded very, very nice people. And they are absolutely convinced that is the way to go. Now, that fact that one nation cannot, one color cannot, uh, on what we, what press used to call Star Wars, or still calls President Reagan's uh, program, we had a, <clears throat> a 
uh, whatever you call it, we call it a vehicle. It's a small, I mean, I hold it like this. But I was in charge, uh, in, I was in charge of technically of, for that vehicle. Uh, that I, you know, I had to issue technical direction of how it goes. But we needed very, very small inertial platform. An inertial platform needed a gyroscope that's just about like that, but it'll be optical gyroscope that you have light going this way and going that way, and when you uh, turn around, you can measure the difference of arrival of light and then give precise guidance. Well, we only use 10 meter of fiber, and to have a precise gyroscope like that, you need 1,000 meters. But we could fit only 10. So we couldn't do anything, so we decided to get, get together scientists and engineers from uh, all nationalities and all colors that we had in the United States. And we met at uh, Massachusetts Institute of Technology for three and a half days and just you know, did brainstorming. That's what we call brainstorming. And one pure Eskimo from Alaska, PhD in physics, came up with the idea how we can employ principle from general theory of relativity that speed of light is the same for all observers regardless where they are located. And it worked and we have a classified patent on it. And that, that vehicle was the first vehicle ever launched that anything ever launched from ship on ocean has shut down a satellite which was impossible to do any other way, but we had to shoot it down. It was our spy satellite, so it doesn't fall into wrong hands. And they used that. Uh, I insisted that we maintain that capability, but that was against the rule to do, but nobody knew. You know, I, uh, that was my idea. I said, I, you know, it's in there, technology is in there, I better keep it, or someday we will need, and we, will, we did need. So, that's, so we demonstrated that uh, if it's all white people or all Anglo-Saxon or uh, Caucasian or if it's all uh, African, you just cannot come with solution. You have to mix and then ideas flow. And so the same thing is for universes. Exploration of universe cannot be done by one nation, one color, one people, but all must go together because, and go together in love, selfless love. Universe will not accept us if we come there for selfish reasons or personal reason. It must be common good. That's what he's telling us. So we have to go that way. Of course, it's hard to change human uh, nature to really accept all that, but they are uh, saying that we will have to simply resign to it. Of course, to you and I, as, as the Christians who, who believe in second coming, that all doesn't matter, you know, but it is, you know, I'm speaking from science point of view, and it is a real issue in, uh, with people who are looking at what the world will be in the future and how do we survive here for a long period of time. And it's a real issue, it's serious, it is not, and, and uh, you know, I don't see they're doing anything wrong by looking at it. But so, you know, <clears throat> if uh, uh, final observer here loves us and our universe is based on a selfless love, how do you and I see that creator? How do we see that final observer or ultimate intelligence? Many people look at the final observer as uh, some, you know, uh, some real mean person sitting up there with some kind of two by four and said that the moment you do something wrong, I told you not to do so. You know, that's how people see uh, God, you know, but, uh, you know, but that is not how what the universe is telling us, you know. The, uh, so they said, oh, he's a judge. He's sitting up there as a judge, and he is, uh, you know, and we need somebody to defend us. But that is not what the universe is telling us. Because God said, I have loved you with an everlasting love. And uh, David said that the, the heavens declare the glory of God. And the universe, our universe, does declare the glory of its creator, and its glory is his selfless love. 
no order. So that, that we must accept that. That is the way. So if we say God is judging us, that's not true. Because Jesus himself said that Father judges no one. Go read John. Gospel by John. God, Father judges no one, but has given all judgments to the Son. Because Son is Son of Man. So that is that states clearly in the Bible. Uh, and then, then some say, oh, you know, uh, there are scribes up there in heaven, you know, angels. And they have two sets of books. And they're writing in this book all the bad things we do. And here they're writing all the good things we do. And then this judge who doesn't care about us, he's looking, okay, how many bad things did you do and how many good? Well, bad ones outweigh good ones, you know, get rid of them. Uh, but that is not what we have. Now, you know, some people may think that they have a lot of good stuff, but the, I look at my case. You know, the book, the pages in the book where they're supposed to write the good things I do are completely empty. There's nothing in them. And these, these pages here are full, and those scribes or angels are pasting in new pages continuously. Do I have any hope? Absolutely none. If that is so, I'm done. You know, might as well just, you know, jump off the building and <laughs> go away. But that is that is not God. Universe is telling us that that is not God we serve. That we serve God, who not who does not only practice. He doesn't practice selfless love. He does not possess it. He is. That's his very nature, selfless love. And he cannot do otherwise. He would violate himself. And that's impossible. So, you know, God didn't, you know, I have discussion in, in Idaho with some people, I had a discussion with some people. Also, if he is love, then he needed something to love. So he created us to have something to love. But that's not true. He created us because he loved us before he created anything. So, you know, that is, uh, it's not that God needs, he, he didn't create us because he needs us. He created us because we need him. So that, that is the, what, what we have to look at. And uh, uh, what is the greatest demonstration of that love? It's, it's the cross of Christ. When I say cross of Christ, <clears throat> I mean <clears throat> what, uh, what Jesus suffered. That's cross of Christ. The cross at Golgotha where he suffered the cross of Christ. So uh, we often look through uh, suffering of the body, but uh, Jesus did not, in my uh, understanding of that, Jesus did not feel physical pain because anguish of spirit was so high that he couldn't feel physical pain. And that anguish of spirit you and I will never know because he hung on the cross. But, uh, you know, this, this final observer <coughs> here, <coughs> or uh, ultimate intelligence that's outside this universe, even though he is beyond our understanding, he came down to this tiny speck of dust right here. That's if you just go uh, maybe two, three million miles away, you would barely see this earth. You know, but God came down and united himself with us in flesh and blood and became one of us, took our sinful biological nature on him, but the spirit that came at incarnation was spirit that did not make a decision. So Jesus, after God educated him for 30 years, he got baptized and went into desert to be tempted, just like first Adam was, was uh, uh, in a position to make a decision. He had to make a decision. So he made a correct decision in the desert, and his life or his spirit that was in him became perfect. If you read Hebrews, Paul said so. That became, he was made perfect by what he suffered. And he lived that perfect life for three and a half years. And then he goes to the cross and he 
takes that life, perfect life, and puts it aside. That is a sacrifice for sin. That is written in the Bible. That's the first goat. Sacrifice for sin. And then God puts in him <clears throat> our life which sinned in the Garden of Eden. Uh, no cho- had to die forever. That life had to die forever. No choice. No way out. You could not correct the spirit that made the wrong decision. It is absolutely impossible to do that. It only can, has to be replaced. And God said in Ezekiel, promised us that he will put a new spirit in us. And he did, do, did so. So on the cross, uh, uh, he who had no sin becomes sin itself, but not a sinner. His body was sanctified body because he lived in him, lived perfect, holy, eternal life. So body was sanctified, and even a new life needs exactly this body, no other. It cannot function in any other body just like old couldn't. So that was preserved, but our life which sinned in Garden of Eden died in the body of Jesus Christ, what we call the second death. No possibility of resurrection. So the life which died Friday afternoon did not rise Sunday morning, but the life that rose Sunday morning, that re-entered body, was Jesus' perfect life that he laid aside. And then he shares that with you and me. What happened, that part of a great exchange on the cross could not be explained by theology, philosophy, or science, because it is apart from every law that rules in this universe here. So we will never know every detail. We must trust Jesus that he did accomplish that. If we don't, there is no hope. So that we must do so. Those three hours of darkness, every single star in this universe here shut down for three hours. Nothing was shining in the universe because God was absent. You go read 1 John. Where God is, it's light, no darkness. Therefore, where he is not, it's only darkness, no light. You know, it's logic. So that then, and those three hours, in science, <clears throat> we cannot explain how could universe be dark for three hours and not cease to exist. Because according to our understanding, if all stars shut down, universe drops to absolute zero, at that point simply ceases to exist, would never come into existence again. But the uh, universe did come back. They come back because there is a promise. If you read Isaiah 54, God said, for a brief moment, I abandoned you. He didn't say, I just you know, forgot you. I abandoned you. And in my anger, I hid my face from you. But in my great compassion, I will come back to you. So that promise uh, <clears throat> supported Jesus on the cross. And, his, and he was able to stay faithful to his mission because of that promise. And he is, from that point on, when after three hours God returned, and he will never leave us again. No matter what happens, he will never leave us again. Oh, love of God, how greater far than any tongue could ever tell. Yes, sir.